Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Interdependence Salon number six, brought to you by Metabolic Studio. Metabolic Studio explores self-sustaining and self-diversifying systems of exchange that feed emergent properties that regenerate the life web. Today's salon will be with Chris Quaz Hohag and hosted by Maya Bond. I'm Millie, and I will be our moderator today. Just a quick note before we begin, we will be recording today's conversation for Metabolic Studios Archive and YouTube. So if you don't want to be seen, turn off your camera by pressing the stop video button in the bottom left corner of your screen. We're going to keep the audience on mute until question time, which will be kicked off by my colleague, Bees, about halfway through our event today. Also, before we get started, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us where you're tuning in from, please do so via the chat screen. It'll be cool to know where you're coming from. If you have any questions while the conversation is happening, please write them in the chat and Bees will call on you to speak during the conversation, during the question and answer period. Before I introduce today's conversation, which I'm really excited about, we'd like to play Quaz's video, Cowboys, Indians, Aliens, and Ninjas. Once a ninja warrior, raised as a Paiyu boy. Uh huh. I used to fight off aliens disguised as a cowboy. Yeah, they invaded the Owens Valley, resolved to get up higher. They marched our people out, they threatened us with fire. Uh huh. They put us on the reservations, tried to douse out our spirits. But the Numa are strong, resilient people of the land, we feel it. And when the ancestors talk, when the ancestors talk, we listen, we listen. And when the spirit says dance, when the spirit says dance, we step in. When the ancestors talk, when the ancestors talk, we listen. All right. These days, everybody, everybody want to be an inspiration, yeah. These days, everybody, everybody, everybody looking for inspiration, yup. To inspire the next generation of writers and thinkers, doers and shakers, movers and makers of big things, big dreams. Who bring in a new world with old dreams? I was raised among the rule breakers and among the risk takers on the reservation taken. Learning ways ancient, yet ageless as the present moment. Hold it in your awareness, don't be careless. We can never own it, maybe they'll clone it, or just record it. And that's as close as your children will get, or your grandchildren not yet born. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Maya Bond, and our guest, Chris Quaz Hohag. Maya is a songwriter, podcaster, activist, and longtime team member of the Metabolic Studio. Our guest today will be Chris Quaz Hohag. Chris is an educator, artist, native of the Owens Valley, raised in Bishop as a citizen of the Bishop Paiute tribe. He is also a descendant of the Kudzatika, the people of the Mono Lake. I apologize if I said that incorrectly. He is a founding member of the Paiuhunadu Alliance, an indigenous-led grassroots alliance united around a great love for the protection of the Eastern Sierras and the Owens Valley. Paiuhunadu is a traditional name of the valley and means the place where the waters begin or the place of flowing water. Chris received his bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of California, Irvine and his master's of education and curriculum and instruction from the University of Washington. His work focuses on language revitalization, youth leadership development, outdoor education, recreation, and building bridges between diverse cultures to unite over our common needs for clean water and healthy lands. Chris has worked with nearly every tribal organization on his reservation, serving Indian people across such topics as education, economic development, language and culture, healthcare and governance. 
he served a two-year term on the Bishop Paiute Tribal Council, acting as a vice chairman during 2014 and 2015, and the Owens Valley Paiute Shoshone Board of Trustees, chairman in 2013 and 2014. Currently, he represents Bishop Paiute Tribe on the Board of Directors of Fort Toyabe Indian Health Project, a tribal health care organization serving seven tribal communities in the Eastern Sierra region of California. Now, without further ado, please welcome Maya and Chris. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Millie. Thank and, you, Millie. Yeah, and thank you, Chris, for sharing that video with us. That was awesome. Um, My pleasure. I feel just really honored. I always say this every time we talk, but I feel really honored to be able to be in conversation with you. And I'm really excited to share this today and you know, be able to hopefully share some education and share some insight with lots of people. So I figured some place we could start is give like a who, what, where, when, why of Paya Hunaru, basically talking about what was Paya Hunaru, what is Paya Hunaru now, and um, how it's become so inextricably tied to Los Angeles. Big intro. All right. Um, first thing, can I, uh, I would like to take the time to acknowledge some things happening in the world at the moment. Um, I want to acknowledge, you know, the police brutality and the loss of life, um, you know, RP to George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, um, you know the violence that we're seeing in our country right now that's affecting a lot of people. I just, um, I want to stand in solidarity with everyone um, who's feeling all that and, and working towards solutions. Um, I believe, you know, I speak for a lot of people when I say that if there's no justice, there's no peace and we need to. Thanks. And so I just want to acknowledge that to begin with. I also want to acknowledge not only our ancestors here in Payahunadu, but also our relatives, our Tongva relatives down in Tovangar, AKA Los Angeles. Uh, you have indigenous peoples of LA. And, um, you know, we, we're all learning all the time. So these are folks and individuals and communities that I'm, I'm getting to learn as, as I'm growing. So I wanna shout out our people out down there who are, who are really holding it down. As we say at the other end of the pipe, the Sakwa Death unites us and, um, you know, we're doing this work for our future generations. And I thank all of you who are part of this as well, because that's that's a part of the same similar work. So um, before I had started, I wanted to make sure I made those acknowledgements today uh, because it's, it's very heavy on a lot of people's hearts. And I think it's important that we take the time to do that. Um, okay, Maya, I'm gonna do my best to summarize. Let's feel free to interject with questions, clarification as well, because, you know, um, this is a topic that I think we're all doing our best to wrap our heads around in this time, 2020. Um, we're having this conversation, but this aqueduct has been in operation for over 100 years. Uh, it would have been 100 years, I believe, in uh, was it 2013, perhaps. Um, and so it's a very complex history that brought us to this time, but it's one rooted in quite a bit of injustice and, and lack of representation for our Numa people up here, um, our Paiute and our Shoshone people, in fact. And um, I'll do my best to kind of weave you through that history. And if we could, we have a wonderful uh, resource, a tool provided by the staff at the Owens Valley Indian Water Commission. And um, there's a link in our chat bar, there should be, and maybe if it's helpful, we can, you know, drop it in while I'm talking to give some context because it provides really nice visuals as well as story uh, text about what I'm going to try to share about now. But, um, you know, our people have been here since time immemorial. We'll have to start with that. Um, I have elders that would, you know, wouldn't want me to say any words, any, any numbers, any years, but there's science that, you know, would uh, support 15,000 years in our region here. And um, so our people have a really intimate relationship with this valley known as Payahunadu or the Owens Valley today. There, um, there's about five reservations in the valley itself with, uh, as we talked about Toyabi earlier, there's seven tribes in that clinic consortium because that includes Death Valley and 
uh, the Bridgeport community in Colville up, up a little further north of us here. But, um, you know, we're essentially one people in this Eastern Sierra. I think there's a really good map showing the breakdown of the, the Paiute peoples and how they come to be in Paiahunadu. It's kind of a, a intermixing ground between Paiute and Shoshones, the, the Northern Paiute and the Western Shoshone. And there's also Southern Paiutes down in Southern California and Las Vegas and all that. And we are kind of the middle ground of the Northern Paiute and the Southern Paiute here in Paiahunadu. Um, as you can see from the picture here, we we have almost everything we need in this valley in terms of resources to survive. And it has been like that for a long time. So um, this is our homeland and Paiutes are really spread throughout the entire Great Basin, all the way up into Oregon, Washington, Idaho, um, through Nevada into, I believe, parts of Wyoming. Um, but the, the, the Paiute and Shoshone are really broad reaching peoples and Hunadu has a long history of our people being here. And I suppose for the purposes of what we're talking about today, you know, um, it's like we're talking about the, in, the, the relationship that we have with the city of LA. So I just think it's important to lay the groundwork that there's a long history here, long before the city of LA ever got involved, which is about a hundred years. So we're talking about this, our people have been here for thousands of years and LA has been here owning the land for about, hundred years and um, so we're we're still in early contact in a way and I think that's really important to say I, I heard a relative from Canada speak to that when you consider the breadth of our people's history prior to colonization you think about we're in you know 150 years of our relationship with our colonizer but that's you think about the lifespan of a human being being 70 or 100 years old that's like two human being lifespans so i think about that and i think about my grandparents being not that long ago experiencing this massive shift of, of society here and so um you know we're here in the owens valley today as this generation of people trying to have a relationship with all colonizers so I just think it's good we orient that that we are in a in a period of early contact even though usually all we talk about is that short period of con early contact when indians started adopting white people's clothes and tools and you know people still want to see you know the mixture they're, they're living in out in the boonies and their old ways and they're adopting a few things and they call that early contact but if you look at the grand scheme this is the first generation, I believe, who's really starting to wrap our heads around how the society works and how is not getting shut out to the degree that all of our previous generations did to some degree. So um, I want to acknowledge that and I, I'm feeling really proud of where we're coming from and where we're going because we have uh, so many intelligent, powerful uh, community members at this time. So many people don't know that here in the Owens Valley, we had a, a a tract of land called the Casa Diablo Indian Reservation set out by executive order prior to any of these reservations that people see here in the Owens Valley today, which are very small. Um, they're kind of like little stamps in the valley. So the Casa Diablo Indian Reservation was originally set aside in 1912, and it was 67,000 acres plus for the, the Indians of the valley. And um, that land is still out there today. It's in fact very, very popular with climbers and outdoors folks. It's uh, currently run and protected by the Bureau of Land Management and the tribe has a co-management agreement with them of that land. But um, for the sake of this historical talk, uh, you know, we, our people never moved out there in modern times as a reservation. It was traditionally a hunting grounds. And uh, we were talking about how this, this reservation was set aside but nothing was ever set up for people to go out there and live. And um, it was eventually taken out of, it was withdrawn for the purpose of giving this land and water resources to the city of LA in 1933. And so they essentially withdrew what was meant to be a home territory for the Indians in order to protect the watershed. And if you look at the, the timeline, it was withdrawn. And then essentially the next year, this land was uh, provided to the city of LA. And uh, that just shows 
the direct relationship with Indian land claims and um, you know our relationship to home and the city of LA is coming into the valley and shaping our history for the next hundred years plus. So um, a lot of people don't know that you know while our, our people have been here for time immemorial, as people see us today as Bishop, Big Pine, Lone Pine, Paiute, Shoshone Indians, Bones Valley, that was largely set up through relationships with the city of Los Angeles and the federal government because they needed bodies to, meaning bodies like a, a, a entity um, in order to sign off and sell the land or to you know write, write it down on paper. So they created the Owens Valley Board of Trustees. And um, that was one of the ways in which they had some representation from people. And then they said that was that was the people's choice to do that. But uh, I wanna follow this, this uh, story map for a little bit about how the lands got sold. And so could you back up just a little bit? There you go, just back to that last text. So the lands here, um, you know, were essentially getting purchased from the city of LA's former mayor in the early 1900s. And there's paper trails to show that. And by the 1930s, the city of LA had owned the vast majority of the private lands in LA, as well as um, some Indian allotments. And at that point was when that exchange happened from, from uh, the federal government to protect all the surrounding lands as LA was buying up the valley lands. So today you'll see LA owns, gee, I don't know the percentage, but vast majority of land within the Owens Valley. And everything on the border, the tablelands and the mountains is all federally protected. And that's a very coordinated effort. And, and at least the public lands being protected here for sure. But it's important to understand the coordinated effort that was protecting the watershed of our region and then essentially taking away claim from the Indians and then giving it to the city of LA in some fairly coordinated efforts at the federal level as well as uh, locally. So if you want to get more information, feel free to, to re re uh, scroll back through this. Um, you can keep scrolling down. So uh, for those of you who have never been here, we are 233 miles away from the Owens Valley. And um, the city of LA ended up started, once they got the land, they received funding to build the, the aqueduct, which is a great engineering marvel. And uh, it was something that basically put a lot of people to work during the time and it allowed the city to grow. But uh, as soon as the aqueduct was put in to bring the water out was when the valley started very much suffering its environmental effects. Um, and a lot of people would say this is kind of the second colonization for the native folks. The first had happened when the settlers came in and we were marched out of the valley uh, roughly 50 years prior in 1863. And then in 1913, the first aqueduct is completed and starts flowing water south. So you know, our life was drastically affected once again. Um, the image shows that in 1970, there was a second aqueduct built parallel to the first one. And it, its purpose was to transport more water, but this time pumped groundwater from below the earth. And um, this had drastically exceeded, extended our impacts on the groundwater. And so you'll see a lot of places that in the 70s might have still been uh, meadows and, and lush have really dried up in the last generation due to the excessive pumping by the city of LA. So um, Bishop is the largest reservation in the valley and that's just where people were. Um, so they're maybe twice the size of some of these other ones. You have Bishop, Big Pine, Lone Pine. Later on came Independence, Benton. Um, in terms of their federal recognition. But, um, you know, this is a really good image right here that shows our lands as they relate to the prior to the exchange and after the land exchange, which officially became on the books in 1939. Um, it shows how much we land had prior 
in Indian hands. And then essentially, as LA petitioned the federal government to, to have this land exchange, they argued that it was in our benefit. But as you can see, we ended up with much less land than even prior to the exchange. Really interesting history if you're able to, to follow through with some of these links. Um, they essentially sold the federal government on this as a greater good, of course, for the city of LA, but they also argued that it was better for us as the natives in the valley. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's still arguable at this moment because of our, uh, you know, this getting separated from our water rights. And today we're still, um, not every single reservation, but I would say uh, Bishop for sure, that's the one I know the best, is still up in the air with their quantified water rights with the city of LA. So in that 1939 land exchange, the federal government, the Bureau of the Reclamation, and uh, on behalf of us, the BIA on behalf of us tribes, basically exchanged those acres for the current reservations. And then, um, and then that's what we were left with. So can you, can you scroll down a little bit? I'm sorry. All right, so this is kind of more modern stuff. Um, you know, we've had people making efforts to speak on our behalf since way back when that land exchange first happened. And, um, you know, we even had elders that took the time, raised the money and went all the way to Washington DC only to get shut the door in their face in their testimonies. Um, these are things that we found during, with some of our allies research. And uh, we're at a time right now of bringing a lot of this, this history to light so that we can share with people what has happened. And to what we're looking at in this picture, Nadu Land and Water Summit. And this was the first time we really had a coordinated strategic planning effort with all the tribes in the valley to look at where we are today and moving forward. And um, we had some really beautiful visions set forth for the future. and. Um, I'm really going to be sharing quite a bit of that group's work today because I think those are visions that we all need to hear moving forward about how we see that, uh, you know, we could be moving into this next phase of things in a more sustainable way. So um, looking at this alliance, or this is not the alliance, but this is the Payahunadu Summit. Um, alliances, which is some of these folks and Overall, I think we want to do much of the work that has been put into motion through this group right here. This group is, is intertribal. Um, it's not all native, but these are people that are working on behalf of tribes and working at every level of government, community, um, the science, the cultural element, and these are the people that are on your front lines here in the, the um, Payahunadu for our valley tribes. Um, I want to go, thank you. I was trying to keep up with that, but I'm going to pull that down. Uh, Maya, can you, do you have any questions if, uh, just for clarification? I know I was going through that. And yeah. It's kind of pulling me around a little bit. But. Yeah, that was super helpful, I think, just to give folks like an understanding of specifically where we're talking about and mm -hmm. what has happened to lead us to this point. Um, and, you know, clearly this is in a very systematic uh, and prolonged oppressive system that's kept, you know, stealing water for over a century now. So um, I guess my question, you kind of touched on this at the end, so I need to get into it, but I'm curious about, you know, how your life has led into your work as an organizer and as an advocate for these issues that you know so intimately and, um, you know, I just from my experience with organizing with you and with the Alliance, I'm really like deeply inspired by the amount of momentum and, um, you know, movement happening towards change. Um, and I would just love to know more about how this has happened in your life, where things have led you to start the Alliance and to start other and to work with other groups that you've worked with. Um, and, you know, hopefully you could also let folks know how they can get involved with 
different, you know, engagements that are happening at this moment. Yeah, um, well, I definitely want to acknowledge everyone's individual path that has gotten us to this point in everyone's efforts. And that, you know, we are, I would say, uh, people who identify with the Alliance right now, Pai Hunadi Alliance, um, we're really picking up the work of previous generations. And we are ensuring that we have, you know, our elders and mentors guidance advising us moving forward. And, you know, for me, this, this has always been about continuing the work of the people that have come before us. Um, you know, I guess to begin with, it, it starts with learning about the, the issue and then caring about it and caring about water. Why does it matter? Um, you know, I have a, I have a almost two year old daughter right now and I'm going through things as a parent with her that is bringing me a lot of memories, I would say from my childhood growing up. And um, I find that it's a lot of the simple things that you don't really think are extremely major as a child that really stick with you as an adult. And, um, and for me, I'm finding that it's a lot of this time in nature that I'm giving my daughter, but I'm having memories of my grandparents or community that put us, took us, took the time to, to make, give us that connection and go to those lakes and mountains and trails. And, um, I think that's where it all starts because without that connection, this doesn't matter to, to people in the modern world. You know, even, even a lot of us natives are just going to work, clocking in, clocking out, earning money, buying things and, and surviving in America. So for people to take a break and to realize that water is life, that this water is flowing 24-7, 365 for the last hundred years out of, out of the bosom of our mother earth where we live here. Um, you know, you have to take the time to want to get interested in the first place. And then it, I think it takes a life of its own. You know, this whole thing about water is life is just on so many levels true. And uh, I really think we're, we're all working through the spirit of this water that isn't just happening here. It's happening in many different places and it's happening on many different webinars right now. I know Winona LaDuke is talking about it in her homeland right now on a webinar and like we're just all speaking the same language I think and we're all uh, listening to the earth. We're all listening to the to the natural world and trying to help communicate it to our fellow human beings what we're seeing as indigenous people who've been in these places for a long time. And so for me I have to on my elders for what they experienced as I take that, you know, take that uh, work to the next level here, what we're, what we're doing. And I think, I guess, what we have an opportunity right now is that we're actually being heard. The fact that you all want to listen to the story, that you all care, that a lot of our allies are taking their time, their energies and their talents to, to bat for us and helping us make documentaries and movies and, um, just spreading the word in this way. This is things that didn't happen, at least on the behalf of, of many of our native people here in that in that time. And, um, you know, we kind of want to build on the success of what happened with the Mono Lake Committee and how they survived, they, they saved Mono Lake. And we, we acknowledge the organizing that went into that. I'm going to take because I want you to talk about that. Can you Which share part? about the Mono Lake Committee and what they achieved? Well, that, that was the generation before me and I was not intimately involved in any way, shape or form, but I just have to acknowledge that they, their organizing uh, effectively stopped the city of LA from destroying that lake, just like they destroyed Owens Lake. And right. um, that was a ton of allies from the urban areas as well as local people. But I think that the model was that you needed more than the local population to speak up for the land and water because there's just only a few of us out here that we're, this is probably, um, if not the most, one of the most isolated, depopulated parts of California. And um, so we really need to educate the people with the, the population, with the voice. And they did a good job with the Mono Lake Committee. And um, I just think maybe moving forward, what's necessary is that we have indigenous leadership in this new age moving forward. And that's, that's why the Paya Hunadu Alliance, I think, is a very key element of that and um, the goal is that we build on what's happening with the Owens Valley Indian Water Commission and um, you know I would even say like the food sovereignty movement happening in our communities and continue 
to push wellness as a whole because um, co environmental health is inextricably linked with community health. And this is an environmental justice issue. And um, we believe that if we're making this land as healthy as it can be, our people can be as healthy as it can be. So we're just identifying the needs still and moving towards solutions. And um, everything we knew with the alliances around wellness and if you don't have water, because they have a hard time being healthy. Absolutely. Um, I feel like it's really timely. You know, we've been having the metabolic studio has been having this conversation, you know, up in Paihunadu about water issues for a couple decades now. But this year in particular, it's really important because LADWP has announced that they're going to be pumping 93,000 acre feet this year, which is the highest amount they've taken since 1991. And just to give a spatial map of what that looks like, that's a football field entirely filled with water. And then if you were to put that football field on top of itself and on top of itself again, you would put so many football fields on top of each other that that would reach 17.6 miles into the air. That's how much water is being pumped this year out of Paihunadu after years, obviously over a century of pumping where people have continuously outcried saying that too much water is being pumped out. You know, this land is being parched and that's important for so many reasons. And I really like what you said about, you know, environmental rights being a human rights issue. And that was actually something Millie and I had a brief talk about last night is like, that is a really important crossover right now because we are connected to our land, you know, especially indigenous communities are connected to the land that they are from. And it's so important for us to recognize that it's not just like a, a uh, theoretical connection. You know, we are literally connected and we eat from the land, we drink from the land. So it's just, I think it's really important right now more than ever for Los Angeles residents to really understand how much water is being taken just from one place you know um so obviously we had touched on the Paihunadu alliance which is something that chris and you know others had been working on for a while and i recently have gotten involved during this covid crisis um, because one of the benefits of the covid crisis was that we were able to take to the cyber community, you know, we were able to meet virtually, you know, that hadn't happened before. And I don't live up in Paihunadu. So that's been really amazing, you know, just having Chris connect and be able to, you know, invite me into that conversation. It's been a huge honor to be able to be involved. But um, I was wanting to ask you, Chris, specifically how the COVID crisis has affected the work you're doing, you know, I touched on that briefly with how it's been able to engage a larger group of people via internet connections and conversations on Zoom, but mm -hmm. how are there other ways that your advocacy, your organizing has been changed by this current pandemic? Well, you know, um, I just think it allows people's, how, do you, how would you put it, you know? Uh, we're, we're living in a time where and I'm not putting anyone on blast locally because I know everyone's doing their, their very, very best, but at various levels of government, we have, we have predictability and non-predictability. We have leadership and no leadership. And it's really a, an organic time for people to step up and help each other. And that's what the Alliance is ultimately. Um, some of the most visible things we've done, you know, obviously we've gotten together and we meet and we talk about these problems in our community and how do we, address them head on just as as people on the ground not as necessarily an entity or an organization because that that's what we're doing right now we're, we're, we're purposely not an entity or organization so that we can move fluidly with the needs of our community but we're made up of people who are a part of organizations in our community and so ultimately we we planned how do we bring what's working in our lives and share these things how do we help our people cultivate wellness and positive coping mechanisms in this time of extreme stress and change. Um, you know, we're living under all kinds of 
um, new situations, stay at home orders and spend about two months here in California. And, you know, we jumped into action very quickly, I would say, and just because we've been talking for years, as, as Maya had alluded to, and I'll give you a little background on how the Alliance started. But in this COVID time, it's just with everything kind of stagnating in a lot of ways, it, we continue to organize in cyberspace and just share on a week to week basis what's working for us and talking to our people and letting them know that we're here as community members to help each other. And I think um, being consistent, being visible, sharing good things, knowledge, resources has just kind of, um, it stands out in a time like this when there's heightened stress and anxiety and a lot of the information is bad and scary and people are worried. We're trying to combat that with information and tools to take care of yourself um, and to be proactive, I guess. Um, does that, how's that sound regarding COVID time? Um, I think that's, it's a lot of different things. I, I, let me really break it down individually because it's important everyone gets um, acknowledged. So uh, one of our core team members is Jolie Varela from Indigenous Women Hike. And um, she's very popular on social media and her story is inspiring to so many people. And um, she has been utilizing her platform to raise money for grassroots people on the ground, like literally giving cash and gift cards. And we, uh, there's, there's was a long standing, um, but not very active free mini library on a reservation where people could leave a book and take a book as needed. So that turned into actually um, toiletries and masks and hand sanitizer and food and water and basic needs for people in their households. Because here in Bishop and other communities in Payahunadu, um, when this stay at home order started, we certainly had our shelves and our stores emptied for quite a while. Uh, not just paper products like everywhere else, but food, meat, vegetables, um, toiletries, and of course the similar things as other places, but it, it hit us pretty hard here. So, um, you know, she's been able to utilize her platform to get those important items to community members and, and you know, just help people on an individual family level as well as educating people. So that's been huge. Um, we have, we've been collaborating with the Cultural Center just to, to know where they're at with things at all times and what can we do to support their work. And um, been on the phone with Maya and others with Metabolic, food for people and, um, you know, bringing elderberry up to someone, some folks here who can make elderberry syrup, which is a medicine here. So, you know, we're just plugging people into other people who are wanting to help, who can receive help and making it move. And I think that's oftentimes what we're not seeing happen in our governments right now is, is the processes are making things get stuck in bottleneck situations. And, and frankly, we're just so loosely organized that we're able to just try to touch base and, and talk about things and get things done. And so, um, and, and ultimately, I, I just has to, I have to commend all the individuals um, and the people and the organizations that are a part of that. So. Um, we're represented from up and down the valley. Our team members are Lone Pine, Big Pine, Independence, and Bishop, and um, they're all doing their part on the ground, as well as collectively coming together and saying, what do we do for everyone here? Um, just just a few more shout outs, you know, Indigenous Women Hike, Paya Hoop Away. Um, you know, that's my, my partner, Kinsen Todd. She makes amazing jewelry, but she provides so much more to the group and you go to the Pai Hoop away, and that's what you're gonna see, but you know, these are cultural teachings that she's able to share, and we're all trying to build this tight-knit community of built of trust and, and love for each other. Um, you know, Legendary Skies is something that I'm behind, and War Party Pictures is another one of our collaborators who does amazing media work, um, helping the Lone Pine Wellness Program down on that reservation get going. You can go to ahobu.com, which is a great website for the Lone Pine Wellness Center. Lots of resources, videos uh, from diet to anti-tobacco use information. And um, also AC Nutrition and Wellness is another one of our, our peoples that's with us tight. And, and so that's, we're wrapped around wellness and culture and um, you know doing the work on the ground. So we also touch base with 
it's folks that do where water flows and the aqueduct between us. So these are, uh, you know, allies that we rely upon heavily. And I, I think the whole purpose of what we're doing is trying to lift each other up so that the valley can have its needs addressed in, in timely manners. Um, Maya, you want to ask me a question? I feel like I'm rambling, but I'm going to I'm keep moving through some of these things I want to make sure I acknowledge. But no, Water I... Commission, Cultural Center, sovereign, Food Sovereignty, those are the most important things. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah. Um, one thing that I noticed that was really empowering given the current you know, health crisis we're in was that the last water commissioner meeting that happened, which was, I believe, 15th of May, um, you know, we were able to get 100 public comments in because the meeting was on Zoom, which meant that it was accessible to people and not just people from Payahunadu, but also people from Los Angeles who, A, might, might not have known it was happening otherwise, but B, that's how many miles? A uh, hundred. How many miles is it away? Um, you know, they say 233, but I think, you know, it's over 200 pretty much from Lone Pine. Up. Yeah, it's a long way to go. And it's frustrating because these meetings happen intentionally under the radar and it's it disenfranchises people from being able to show up and say what they think or even having the opportunity to hear about what's happening, you know, so that was a big thing that I thought organizing and moving forward, it would be awesome if the standing committee meetings could happen virtually for however much longer they need to happen so that people can say what they think. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, we help people, we really appreciate everyone in LA getting on and getting involved because, you know, we all have to hold our leaders accountable right now to create this, this world that we want to see. And uh, 100 public comments was unprecedented in a standing committee meeting where they kind of just expected to go through the motions and get it done. But that many people showed up questioning, what are you doing in our name here in this beautiful valley that we care about? And so I think they're gonna take notice if we, if we have consistent pressure and people continue to, to educate themselves, educate their friends and family and um, get engaged. LADWP has a new tribal engagement policy that they conveniently seem to ignore, but on paper, you know, they really are moving in the right direction. We just have to help them follow their own policies and hopefully adopt more, you know, stricter policies that actually they respect native people up here so that they're good partners in managing our homelands rather than just continuing the extractive policies which is old, old science, old knowledge. We all know this, yet people are, you know, I think they just want to make money. And, you know, how do you get around that? I mean, my water is money, water is dollars. If you would live in LA and you get water in your faucet, you're paying a bill. The tribes aren't seeing none of that. I mean, these are, these are just kind of the, the way that it is. So I understand why it's hard for them to change their water management policies, but if the citizens of LA demand better management, if you know, I don't think anyone wants to see a further damage here, turn this into a, a more extreme dust bowl than it already is. You can ask the citizens of Lone Pine if it's bad enough right now. I mean, they're getting, they're having generational sickness that's due to the impacts of LADWP. And if they don't stop the way they're headed, it's just going to get worse. So, I mean, we just have to talk real change instead of little mini band-aid changes and look good like pre PR. Oh, we're doing this, we're doing that. Like we're serious. Let's make sustainable change for a generation instead of um, just talk about it and kick the can down and have a little meeting every year and do the same thing. Right. And also something that, um, you know, I know, at least I know most of the people who gave comments at that committee meeting were really wondering what can we do next? You know, what are the next steps we can make to keep engaged, you know? And it's, I told everyone, follow all these Instagrams. We'll have more to tell you soon. And we do, which is that LA DWP decided that even though a hundred people showed up, which normally there's only around three, I guess, public comments that happen. And now 
all of a sudden, because people are hearing about it, there's a hundred people coming and saying, you cannot do this. This is theft. You know, this is not gonna, we don't stand by this decision. And they're planning on going ahead with it. So now moving forward, our goal is to send letters to the mayor and other city officials to ask that, you know, they please listen to what we're saying and please don't take this much water this year from Owens Valley. And also reconsider how they get water in the first place. You know, Los Angeles allows so much water. I have it written the amount of water, but I'm not looking at it right now, but run off of our streets into the LA River and out into the ocean, which is, you know, Metabolic is working on the water wheel project right now, bending the river back into the city. And that's just a huge, huge shift happening where people are learning that you can lift the water out of the Los Angeles River and clean it using, quote unquote, you know, natural methods using plants and sound and different fibers to clean it and distribute it, you know, and that's, I'm just really grateful to Lauren and the Metabolic Studio for thinking in that direction. But it's like, this is just one project. We need a whole, Los Angeles as a city should be funding these kinds of changes because it's not sustainable to even consider we could be taking water from the Owens Valley in the way that we are. Um, so that's my yeah. rant me to my next question which is we're talking about reimagining Paihunadu and what are the ways that you would like to see actionable steps towards change you know how would you like to see Paihunadu in the near future how would you like to see it in the distant future um, I know that you we've been talking a bit about the Shumi land tax that you had mentioned um, which is a voluntary tax and I know you had been you know throwing out the idea of how this could be implemented and used for greater good in Kayahunadu, but um, maybe you could explain what the Shumi land tax is and yeah, answer those questions. I'm done with my rant now. Yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to write this down so I don't forget what I want to tell you. And then, uh, same okay, so there's two things right off the bat in addition to the Shumi land tax idea. So uh, the Shumi land tax is something that's currently happening in uh, the Bay Area of California, a voluntary um, annual financial contribution that non-Indigenous people who are living in traditional Chochenyo and Ohlone territory make to support the critical work of what's called the Sogoreate Land Trust. The way that could work here is that as ratepayers are paying their regular monthly or bi-monthly fee to the LEDWP, you know, we have to perhaps work with DWP. I'm sure that it make them look good. They'd probably be okay with it, but you send a portion, maybe a dollar or a dollar for every bill, you know, to this fund that is going to support the local um, indigenous population working on land management projects, for instance. Um, you know, there's various ways to make that work, but I think a voluntary land tax is is a very doable thing or just that word might not be the best way to look at it as land tax but how do you put a contribution of the bill you're already paying and ask that it go to the locals where it's affecting their homeland rather than go to the massive municipality that is uh, extracting the water so that's that's an idea um another pretty uh, clear idea up here is that how do we get native representation on the LADWP Board of Commissioners or um, tribal votes, I guess you could say, at the LA Inyo Standing Committee. Um, we have a couple of Native people that are on that or have been on it, but basically you have Inyo and you have LA. And then this thing called tribal consultation or tribal sovereignty is essentially thrown out the window by LADWP and um, we really need them to improve their tribal consultation policies so that they respect tribes for the sovereign governments that they are um, and me that's why I say have my representation on the board of commissioners because that's more representative of nation to nation or, or government to government relationships we're aware that the LADWP is a department of a city each tribe here is a tribal nation, which means they're roughly equivalent to the state of California in 
federal Indian law. So they need to understand that and respect that. And um, I think that's the direction we're headed. Those are just three, I think, solutions that we could move forward. Part of the problem is just, um, you know, I think we need we need pressure from the city of LA residents though. And we, we need to continue to put in um, representatives locally that are, you know, in line with our values and want to see this get better with time and not just kind of same old, same old. Thank you guys so much. That was super informative and I'm positive that a lot of our audience here today learned a lot. Uh, thank you again, Chris. Thank you, Maya. You guys are just amazing, and thank you for so much information. Um, I will now turn it over to my colleague, Bees, for Q&As. Thanks, Millie. Thanks, everyone. And if you have any questions for those of you who are watching, feel free to still put them into the chat bar as we're speaking. Our first question is coming from Lauren. So, Lauren, I think you can unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Of course, my dogs uh, are choosing right now to bark, so I'm going to try and squeeze my question uh, in between barks. But first of all, thank you, Maya and Chris, for an amazing <laughs> conversation. Uh, um, Chris, uh, four years ago, we met with a, a, a bunch of people gathered in Lone Pine to have a series of conversations um, about uh, what Metabolic Studio could ask the LA DWP to do um, as a kind of um, gesture of reciprocity for the private water right that we garnered to lift 106 acre feet of wastewater from the LA River, cleanse it, and distribute it over 50 acres in East Los Angeles without the exchange of capital and in doing so, forming an independent citizen's utility. Part of that utility's concept is to acknowledge the source of the water in Paya Hunadu. And we sat together over four uh, meetings, and one of the things that came out of that was the idea that the leasehold of Kehoe Hot Springs, which was um, coming up to the end of its uh, tenure would be transferred to uh, a tribal entity so that uh, a tourist amenity like that could be uh, number one, a learning, learning tool for future generations of people in the Owens Valley and Payahunadu to tend to their watershed using native practices. And secondly, to acknowledge that the tourist industry could be lucrative for the tribes and offer um, some independent revenue. So it's been a while since we talked about that and I wondered if you could tell us if, if anything has happened with Kehoe Hot Springs and whether, what's your opinion about that idea? So glad you asked, thank you. I, as one thing I didn't mention and I'm really happy you brought it up. Um, you know, I, I'm not aware of anything happening in regards to what we just mentioned, what you just talked about, and we had talked about um, prior, but I think it's a really important time to talk about that right now. So um, for those that don't know, Keos Hot Springs is a hot spring between Bishop and Big Pine, kind of right in the middle and just to the west of the highway. And it's, um, you know, it's a hot ditch naturally, as well as a, a pool that's owned and leased land from the LADWP. And um, all of our native people have been wanting control of that land since we lost it. You know, that's, that's a very sacred place that um, every family has a tie to in the area in one way, shape or form up until right now in modern times. Um, one thing I've noticed is that I, this could be good, but it's also a slippery slope. Um, you know, in this COVID time, there has been uh, newly constructed permanent gates put out there to prevent anyone from driving in. And I think that that's okay for the time being for protecting and preventing and, and allowing it to heal as a place. It's been pretty damaged over the years. Um, but I think in terms of a water source that's a, a sacred healing grounds culturally, um, I think it's very important that we get 
control of that in due time, whether it's an individual tribe or a collective of tribes, I think that's probably, I could, I could confidently say the single issue that every tribe would probably agree upon, even though there's a quite a few issues that we don't agree upon. That might be the unifying issue if we were focusing on a particular piece of land to, to try to get, you know, what do you call it, you know, rights to protect once again. And, um, you know, I understand that the, the tourism as well. I think tourism is, um, it's, it's a little of a double-edged sword in our region when it comes to our culture and history and our spirituality. And that's, that's understood by me and a lot of folks, but it's also the economics of our region. And um, as an educator myself, I see tourism as a massive opportunity to, to reach the public and teach them um, the information they need to know to be the best stewards of our lands. Because if we don't teach them, they're going to either have no idea of our story and why this is important to us, or they're going to get their information elsewhere and, and they may be misinformed. So um, to me, it's very important that we, we continue to, to connect with our visitors who, who love this place for their own reasons. We know this. This is a very special place and visitors aren't going to stop coming here. Um, its own tourism is only growing in the Eastern Sierra from Yosemite to Death Valley. And we have to acknowledge that's the world that we're living in and we have to adapt to deal with it. And um, I'm all for educating people. And if you happen to make money educating people, great, but education is the most important thing if we're gonna make these changes as a society of managing the land in a sustainable manner that uh, you know hopefully does less harm moving forward. Thank you for bringing up cues. Let's do that. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Tristan, uh, I'm unmuting you now to ask the next question. Hey. Uh, so, um, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, Maya, and thank you, Metabolic Studio. This has been a really great conversation. Um, the question that I had was, uh, you know, in this time of uh, stay at home orders and, uh, you know, there's even people protesting about sort of infringements on our freedom. I don't know, this concept of freedom is something that seems relevant at this moment. And, uh, you know, I also thinking a lot about um, how, you know, the subtler colonialist kind of vision of freedom is sort of predicated on this, uh, this idea of, of uh, freedom for a certain privileged group that can then have the freedom to exploit, right? To exploit resources, land, and people. Um, and it's, it's often a, a vision of freedom with no restraint, you know, like that, that any kind of sort of uh, infringement on these perceived freedoms is seen as like an affront. Um, I just wanted to kind of get your perspective on, on the concept of freedom and, and sort of a, a, a more sustainable freedom or a more inclusive freedom. You know, what does freedom look like that has respect um, for, for others' freedom? Um, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think you worded it very well. Um, so I'm going to say listen to him. But, you know, I'll add to that, you know, um, I, in a way – you know, the settler colonial version of freedom is a freedom for capitalism. It's a freedom to make mm. as much money as you possibly can in this country. It, as a native, it's actually been a struggle in my life to align with that value that America holds so high. You know, mm. it's one thing when you're in the city, living that life and not connected to the land and just going in the grind, you get lost in it. You really do. It's, it's very much a, a real mentality. A, you know, of just making that money and paying the bills and doing it. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, you, you're tied to a place like this and money takes a different shape. It takes a different uh, role in your world. And, and my idea of freedom is a lot of times fresh air and clean water and, and peace and quiet. And, you know, I realize that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a, sometimes far-fetched compared to someone's idea of freedom living in an urban jungle. But mm. as Native people, that's, I would think that's where our, our freedoms got changed is we were, you know, we were living a free life and then all of a sudden you're rounded up and you're put in this situation. To, and um, so I guess I would say, you know, yeah, we, we have a freedom for capitalism. And so 
someone's going to suffer in that type of a system. And whether it's indigenous people here or indigenous people uh, on the other side of the world, um, when freedom is, is prioritized for the money makers, then we're going to have a problem. I think we have to have responsible capitalism. I'm not entirely against capitalism. And as I've grown, you know, I understand the inherent hustle within indigenous people to be entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I've driven across the Navajo Nation and seen the vendor booths on the side of the road. Native people have been selling their goods and their wares for generations upon generations. You know, they're, whether it's food or crafts, I mean, you are, you, you bring your gift into the world and then you share it and you should get compensated in an mm -hmm. equal way, equitable way. But I think, um, you know, our native societies had more so social, social entrepreneurship wrapped in that, you know, there's, it's not, ca it's not just financial gain for the sake of financial gain. And in, in a lot of our societies, I would say across Turtle Island and probably beyond, you know, it was the generous ones who were considered, um, you know, that's the wealthy person. And mm -hmm. so there was a different concept of wealth and accumulation and, and respect and status. So status came from how much you could give rather than how much you can accumulate. And right now we have a fundamental, um, we're on our head. We're fundamentally flipped. Look who's, who we're, I don't you know, who our president is and how that came about mm -hmm. and why, and what people were looking to that, like why, why that was attractive to them. And we have to look at bigger things. We can't just say, can this person make money? You have to say, is this a good person? Does this person care about people? Does this person care about non-humans? Does this person care about the earth? Otherwise, this person might make decisions that's going to hurt us collectively. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, there's a lot to learn from Native societies. And uh, I, I'm not inherently against capitalism, but surely we need to modify our current model in this country to be more respectful of indigenous peoples, brown and mm -hmm. black peoples, and um, the lower class as a whole, you know, um, we should always look after the most vulnerable in our societies, our elders and our babies and our, you know, weak ones. We, we have to do that. That's what leaders do. And um, our country, you know, is in the midst of a wake up call because our vulnerable ones are the ones who are, who are dealing with are getting you know the brunt of the pain right now in a lot of ways and that's not the way it should be hmm. and um so yeah i hope that answered it i mean I, none of us are perfect our tribal governments are far from perfect and uh, but governance is super important and I, i'm glad you asked that because i think we all need to be critical however we engage with society, you know, reinforce that, that we're living in. Yeah, no, I, I thank you for that. And I, and I like kind of what you're bringing up around, um, in a sense that, uh, this kind of more exploitative sense of freedom is also predicated on like an idea, a very like, uh, separate idea of the individual. Um, and I, I like what you're bringing in about sort of the collective and the community and a more kind of expanded consciousness of of what what is of benefit to you right that it that it is actually a benefit to to invest in clean air and in your environment and in the more vulnerable parts of your community so yeah thank you for for that thank you everyone who asked questions chris thanks for taking the time to speak to us today about your work in owens valley this was very informative. We're getting really good positive feedback on the chat bar if, you're, if, you're, if you get a chance to look. And Maya, thank you again for all of your activism and hosting this conversation. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jaime Lopez Walters, who will be sharing today's shout outs. Jaime? Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, lots of the things that have been said today were super, super relevant, of course. And some of the shout outs actually reference um, quite a few of the orgs that have been uh, that have been mentioned. Uh, for starters, I wanted to bring up the LADWT's DWP's 2020 pumping plan. As you guys heard, they're planning on pumping 75,000 to 95,000 acre feet of water this year, and are moving forward despite the amazing 104 public comments that were given at the LA um, 
Inyo County Standing Committee meeting, uh, which was held on May 15th. And uh, there are some links in the chat bar as well to uh, DWP's actual pumping plan and to the comments or the response that was given by um, Inyo County Water Department, um, which is kind of the process by which they do that. You know, one puts out a plan, they respond, and they said, we don't agree with this. And then DWP just goes ahead and does whatever they want. I just wanted to bring this up once again, because ironically, I was remembering the numbers of 93,000 and it rang a bell uh, in my mind. And I looked it up and the current use of water spread on the Owens Lake to keep dust down is 95,000 acre feet. So we're talking the same amount of water that is being pumped out of the ground is being spread on a lake, which dried up because the LADWP took surface water in the first place in the you know, early part of the century in the 19 teens and 20s very strange kind of like thing to think about. Um, also, it was the construction of the second LA aqueduct in the 1970s and the subsequent pumping of groundwater in order to fill the demand that that aqueduct created, the second one, uh, which led to protests from the community and eventually the creation of the LA Inyo County Long-Term Water Agreement um, which stipulates minimum amounts of water to be spread on certain areas of the valley and aims to protect native vegetation and also aims to protect livelihoods of people working the land. So there's some kind of assurance every year of like there's going to be this much water that you get allocated. And it's within that context that I want to give a shout out to another organization because Mono County, which is just north of Inyo County, during that time in the 1980s was not part of the water agreement uh, that was signed and this is what led to this current situation. So there's an organization or rather a coalition called the Keep Long Valley Green Coalition. And in 2018, the LA Department of Water and Power announced that it would be cutting water to ranches in Long Valley uh, on land that has been irrigated for nearly a hundred years as we know it and most likely longer before then by native people. This is just kind of, you know, we know that for a hundred years or so ranchers that have come from elsewhere um, have been irrigating these lands and this ancient caldera which is north of the Owens Valley includes the headwaters of the Owens River and receives snow melt from Mammoth Mountain just to give you a context of, of where this place is. So these irrigated meadows have been vital to wildlife and to cattle and thus the livelihoods of, of ranchers um, in that area for uh, a long time and both have been threatened by this move. So um, in response to that, there was a coalition of environmentalists, ranchers, native people, recreationalists, and local government that came together to fight to keep Long Valley green. And so I just wanted to give you guys an update on where that's at. Currently, uh, this year, due to pressure from the coalition, LADWP actually agreed to provide the amount of water that the coalition was looking for. So at this moment, they've turned their attention to 2021 and beyond. They've hired a consultant to elevate uh, this issue in LA County. So somebody that can actually speak to people in power about this issue specifically. And, and they're working towards creating a long-term water management plan, similar to what Inyo County has, although hopefully uh, with you know, better, better odds for them, uh, and which would include a system to determine water allocation based on that year's snowpack. So like this year we had 75% of normal. We would say, well, maybe then the amount of water that you get to spread on these meadows which are used by cattle which are also used by all kinds of native birds and all kinds of other um, uh, it creates habitat basically uh, so that that's that's kind of their goal and if you're interested in learning more about that coalition there's two different websites that are good to go to one is the friends of the inyos website and their keep long valley green page and that link will be added to the chat as well as mono lakes recreation and their keep long valley green page uh, next, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the Owens Valley Growers Co-op and the Independence Civic Club. So they've joined forces uh, in Independence and they're sponsoring a food bank that has free lunches every Wednesday and Saturday at the Owens Valley Growers Building, which is at the Independence High School on Market Street. And this is to help people out during the pandemic. So by having lunch when the food bank is open, people are uh, encouraged to avail themselves of anything they need, no matter what their financial circumstances. And, and the food bank is funded by donations of money, but also produce from local growers, which the Metabolic Studio is planning to uh, contribute to as well as um, our farm here in the Owens Valley, which, is just, which we've just planted, starts producing uh, uh, some of our, uh, our food will go to them as well. So they're a 501c3 nonprofit. Their donation, any donations are 
tax deductible. So that's cool. Uh, also, if you were a co-op member, you can participate in their bulk food buying program uh, with orders and deliveries being placed once a month. Um, other Owens Valley Growers co-op initiatives in, um, include uh, master food preservers and the master gardeners workshops, produce swaps and other community events, but those are currently on hold you know, until um, things change and people can gather in groups again. And then just to mention the civic club specifically, one of the other critical functions that they give or, or um, provide is that they hold candidate forums. So they invite political candidates to come and visit in person and have face-to-face -face or I guess mask to mask conversations um, with their constituents. Um, it was mentioned in the conversation, this next one, so the Owens Valley Indian Water Commission, amazing org based in Bishop, led by Terry Red Owl. Uh, they work to ensure that the future seven generations forward and beyond have a healthy homeland. So to that end, there's four strategic directions that they're focused on. They're strengthening tribal leadership, collaborating uh, for action, telling their stories and sharing traditional values. And just wanted to mention one of the things they've done recently. So a major contribution they were able to make uh, to their communities revolves around food security and food sovereignty. So the commission successfully applied for and received agriculture related funding that has enabled them to increase capacity for individual Native American food producers by providing them with grant funding to improve your existing businesses and to start uh, new food operations, either and also technical support and training or legal support. So some of the projects they helped um, by providing individual grants include an, uh, a new local egg supply operation, a tomato farm, increasing a small cattle herd, land improvements to increase food production, garden assistance for uh, a produce supply business that includes a bee pollinator component, and garden assistance for a tribal member food truck business that will enable this producer to grow vegetables for his business. So these are all businesses that are based and exist on the reservations. Uh, the commission also uh, provides environmental protection services to environmental communities such as environmental education, youth camps, uh, water quality, sampling, monitoring, and they're continually seeking out partners and allies to help them reach their goal for a healthy homeland. So definitely check them out. Um, they're amazing. Also mentioned in the conversation, Bishop Tribe Food Sovereignty Program. So since 2015, uh, they've been working to increase access to and awareness to healthy, traditional, environmentally responsible, community-grown food. And um, recently, uh, they partnered with the Owens Valley uh, Indian Water Commission to increase the number of fruit trees on the reservation. So they collaborated to secure 300, no, 250 uh, rootstock uh, of fruit trees, and then they brought in a trainer and taught people in the community how to graft fruit trees. So that's pretty amazing and, and working towards food sovereignty. And then within the context of food sovereignty and uh, gardens, uh, turning to a metabolic studio project, it's just the metabolic soil project. So we are uh, dusting off, so to speak, and reviving a project that we, uh, we started in 2008, um, which is to build, create soil, healthy compost in the Owens Valley to then distribute to people who need it. So um, currently what we're doing uh, and the model that we're working with is to um, create um, batches of compost in the location where the, the, um, the resources are, so where the manure is or where the leaves are, and bringing those um, together. And then once we have finished compost, we're going to bring that to the IOU garden in Lone Pine and set up a distribution uh, network to people and gardeners. And uh, in exchange, uh, we ask people to uh, contribute their time and produce to others in the community in need of help. So if you want more information on that, you can talk to me. My name is Jaime. Uh, my number, you can put that in the chat bar as well, 213-308-2313. Uh, I can give you more info as that develops. Uh, and then on a similar trajectory, uh, Metabolic Studio also has uh, food growing in Los Angeles. So there's a, a fava growing project that we've been working on this fall and spring. And uh, uh, there is a site which we call the Anabolic, uh, which is adjacent to our building uh, in LA. It's also adjacent to the LA River. It's a former brownfield. And the amazing farm lab team has turned that into a productive garden full of favas. It's about a quarter acre of a garden. And uh, so far we've harvested 372 pounds of fresh beans and 30 pounds of dry beans and we've been distributing those uh, over a wide, over the area that we've been talking about today, all the way from East Los Angeles to the Bishop Tribe, uh, to Jolie, and also uh, this coming weekend to the Lone Pine Tribe, to Kathy Bancroft. So 
those are the shout outs. There's one last thing that I want to mention, and this is kind of like a informational bit uh, for people listening to this and thinking, oh my God, yeah, the Owens Valley, I've wanted to go there or I want to go back there. Um, what's going on during this particular time as far as recreation in the Inyos um, and Inyo County and in Mono County. So, you know, since Southern California cities and counties have opened up their beaches, the parks, the trails again to the public, I think many people are assuming, oh, the Eastern Sierra must be open to the public as well. And let's go up there and recreate. And in actuality, figuring out what the current restrictions are is pretty complicated. So I thought I'd put together a quick little list of, um, of information in that regard. So first thing is, Governor Newsom's stay-at-home order, which went into effect on March 4th, is still in effect, and as such, travel for recreation is currently not allowed in California. Uh, the recent openings of parks and loosenings of restrictions actually are meant to allow local people to recreate locally only. Uh, and so Inyo County's order restricting hotels and short-term rentals from renting to recreational travelers is also still in effect. So if you come to the Owens Valley, the likelihood you're not going to find a legal place to stay basically uh, some people may rent to you but it's legally not allowed all campgrounds in the area are closed so the forest service campgrounds could be opening up at the end of june but uh, we don't have a fixed date for that so you're not going to find any campgrounds uh, the alabama hills national recreation area uh, incredible spot everybody should come visit at some point it is open to the public uh, as of Memorial Day weekend, there was a lot of people there, but this first camping uh, being legal there is true. But however, traveling to the area is legally not true. So uh, that's a bit of a conundrum there. Uh, the trails in the Inyo National Forest are open for local use. And when I talked to the Interagency Visitor Center, which is the place in Lone Pine where one would normally go to get a wilderness permit to be able to go into the backcountry and actually enjoy um, uh, camping and backpacking in, in the mountains, they have a new system that they've set in place, uh, which starts on operating on June 1st, where you can call in, request your permit, and then there's some safe way that you can go pick it up. And similarly, there's gonna be walk-up uh, permits. I think those are actually over the phone or over the internet as well. Uh, importantly though, this current new system that they have in place excludes the um, Whitney Trail. So anybody that has permits for the Whitney Trail in early June, probably gonna get an email telling you that um, your permit is no longer valid and hopefully helping you set up something for the future. But right now, uh, the Whitney area, the Whitney Trail is not accessible. And the reason for that is basically there's a, a complete lack of, um, of um, people, manpower to be able to maintain the trail. Whitney Trail is like, receives like 40,000 visitors a year uh, and they don't have the manpower to actually staff it. Uh, so fishing season is open in Inyo County as of today, actually. I looked it up, I was like, oh my God, okay. So people can fish again. If you're local, you can go out and fish. Uh, Mono County uh, has been open since May 23. And uh, of course, there's lots of people that are actually ignoring the stay-at-home order and they're recreating in Inyo and Mono County. So there's a huge increase in dispersed camping in places that are not official campgrounds, which also leads to a lot of trash, a lot of human wa feces, waste, and, and a lot of trampling of vegetation. Uh, so we're, our message right now at this time is please recreate locally, postpone your visit to the Eastern Sierra to a later date when the facilities to receive you are back up and running. So, thank you. Thank you, Jaime. The Metabolic Studio has a tradition closing each salon with some spoken word. Before we get to that, I'd like to encourage everyone to join us next week at the same time. And don't forget to sign up on our website and social media for a salon with Lin Fang, a soil and compost ecologist. We'd love to see everyone there. We'll now get to our spoken word, which, is, which will be read by Tazba Rose Chavez. Tazba is a performance poet turned director and television writer. She is a citizen of, of the Bishop Paiute tribe from Numu Dene and San Carlos Apache tribes. Thank you for sharing with us today, Tazba. Awesome, thank you for having me. Um, Manahu, as she said, my name is Tazba. I am a Bishop Paiute tribal member, just like Chris. So Chris is my homie. We know each other for a long time. Um, yeah, I'm going to read um, a poem for you that is called, When Did You Forget? And this is the first time in my whole life I've done performance poetry over Zoom. So here we go. Hang on, I gotta get in my poet mood. <clears throat> when did you forget? 
that you can't live without the earth? When did you forget that you will suffocate without trees? How did they cut down the forest that you hold in your limbs? How did they drain you of the creeks and the river banks in your veins? What made you bring your mother to her knees and made you walk away while you watched her beg you from the street? What made you never go back to see if she'd survive that kind of heartbreak? Day's opposition played asphyxiation with a ribbon made from chaotic city light -like constellations. Held me close, whispering radiation waves into the shorelines of my hair. This sounded like harps, but it felt like spiders in my ears. I couldn't hear myself. As I drove through this labyrinth of stoplights and traffic, in this machine that they say takes you to your dreams, it's only ever taken me to skyscrapers and greed. A place that harvests from our mother's bones that carves her deeply and sews her up with concrete bandages, binding her growth to her sides, ignoring her suffocation, as her skin grows hot over time to constrict her breathing to a pattern that she doesn't know, I can see her breathing through the manholes. Just because you can't see her behind these buildings or roads doesn't mean she isn't there. We watch from our couches the axis of her balance melt away. And we watch her love meet a drought that dries her eyelids into cracked deserts and her eyelashes into dead trees. We cover up her points of pulse so we don't have to deal with ignoring her heartbeat. We bask in our indoor pools while neglecting lakes and oceans. We drink our bottled water, discarding the remains inside her while forgetting how to breastfeed from her streams. How bad we hurt is how bad she hurts. And I've always wondered if any of my lovers have ever felt the waves in my veins crashing into the expectation of my spine. In an open lot off the freeway, I lie face and belly down so the earth can coax my metronome back to her beginning, so our heartbeats can sink, so that I can remember that her body has more cuts and more bruises, more life and is more fluid than anything I tell myself I have endured. They say when you're lost, you should come home. Come home to your mother's heartbeat. Come home to your father's days. Come home from the moon to remember how you're made. I found her there in the same spot that I left her. And I spoke to her in the love language of her childhood, in the melody of her beginning, in the deep breathing of the truth to go back to the first. Back to the first speakers, the first leaders, the first scientists, the first doctors, the first healers, the first movement, the first people, the first womb that carried all of us. She shifted in her nature. Her posture became my spine. And her branches stretched around me to rush deliver oxygen into my worth through my ears. And her eyes became a mirror in which I've never felt more secure. She held my back against her chest while we let the sun soak our faces and we listen to the leaves talk to each other about their day. And her eyes became a mirror. Like I said, I've never felt more secure. When will you remember how you're alive? Thank you. That was powerful. Thank you so, so, so very much. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you again, Chris. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Tazba. Lauren Bond and the Metabolic Studio team. Kind of we'll unmute everyone now to allow a post-conversation or mingling as we say goodbye. Super grateful for everyone attending and learning where Los Angeles uh, water comes from. Be well and safe. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Tazba, that was so... That was great. Oh, yeah.